Um, please go ahead and turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. And we are, if, if you're new with us, we are working through the book of 1 John or the letter of 1 John, and then we're going to go to 2 John and 3 John. And this is the Apostle John, the one who loved Jesus, and Jesus loved him, who was with him. It is him writing to the church or the churches in which first received the gospel. So this is the same John who wrote the gospel of John. And if you understand the gospel of John, John wrote it so that we may believe in Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we will have life in his name. So he wrote the gospel there's four Gospels, and they talk about Jesus. They reveal Him to us where we can read His teaching. We can understand what He did and ultimately decide what we believe about this person named Jesus. John obviously was convinced that indeed He was the Son of God. And I hope that you have been convinced as well. If you're still kind of fuzzy about who Jesus is, Read the Gospels. In particular, you can start with John or you can start with Matthew or Mark or Luke to understand who Jesus is. Understand how he's different than any other person who lived. Understand how it connects to the Old Testament and what he did through his life and, of course, his resurrection. So John wrote these things down and sent it out, and the word of Christ was being spread throughout the region and, again, even to us in our day. Now, these churches were being established, and John then wrote his, these next letters to these established churches to give them assurance that they have eternal life. So the first letter was written, the gospel that they would know who Jesus is, and then these letters were written to give assurance of eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says exactly these things. It says here, he says, John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So written to the church, written to believers. Why? So that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, the truth is, at times, sometimes, we wonder, do I truly believe? Do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when I die, I will be in heaven, will spend eternity with Christ and the new kingdom? After last week, I had several people talk to me and say, thank you, that was so helpful because at times I wonder, do, am I really a Christian? And by the way, the devil will try to trick you in believing that you're not if you are, okay? Or he'll try to trick you to believe that you are if you're not, okay? It goes both ways. So John was helping that church, the apostle, this pastor helping that church to give them assurance of their salvation and helping other people who thought that they believed but yet their life denied that truth. So in this letter there are multiple questions that John puts forth for us litmus tests or diagnostic tests that we are to first and foremost ask of ourselves. Is this true about me? Okay, And then we have to consider about the people around us. Is this also true about them, those who consider themselves to be questions? And last week in the beginning of this chapter, we were giving two questions. The first one being, do we walk in? in the light, that God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with God, but yet walk in the darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. And so we talked about that, what that means to have fellowship with God and to walk in a way that is connected to God and walking in the truth of the gospel, the truth of ourself and the truth of who he is. Second, connected to that, 
There, John goes in and talks about the nature of God forgiving us of our sins, right? And so we have to um, uh, acknowledge that we have fallen short of the goodness or the glory of God. And that distance, unfortunately, causes issues between our relationship. But the good news is if we own, and this was last week, and confess our sin, take responsibility for it, and ask God for forgiveness, God is faithful and just, again, His character, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is, my friends, good news indeed. So John puts these things forward as questions for us to ask ourselves. Do I walk in the light and do I own and confess my sins? Now in today's passage, and we are in 1 John chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 3. We're going to do this section all the way to 11. So if you do have a Bible, open up 1 John chapter 2. And if you don't have a Bible... We have good news for you. They're in the pews right in front of you, right right in the middle. There's a Bible. You can open that up. You can turn to page 1054. As we look then again to this letter to consider these questions anew. And John this morning will find three questions we must ask ourselves to know if we have eternal life. And so for most of us, these should be confirming. These should be hope-filled. They should compel us to continue in the way that we're walking. For some of us, we need to consider, is this indeed true of me? And we pray every morning, 9 o'clock, for this service. This is the focus of the morning. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear. We ask the Holy Spirit to be present working in us, and we ask that God would do his work among us as he draws his people together. Again, we also pray that God would help me and us to communicate what is most uh, important, again, which is the word of God. And I trust that God helps us in these things. So I want you to look through the lens of Scripture and to examine yourself as, again, this pastoral heart of John the Apostle brings these questions forward to help encourage and strengthen and perhaps convict us. So the first question that we see in our passage this morning is this. Do I keep His commands? Okay, this is the third in what is John presented in the book, but our first one this morning, we're asking ourselves, do I keep His commands? And so we're going to start in verse 3, and we're going to break it down bit by bit. So here we go. 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 3. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Okay, there again is His thesis. Now we know, we can know, that we have come to know Him, being in relationship with God. Well, how do we know that? If we keep his commands. Now he goes on and says, now, whoever says, well, I know God, I know Christ, I I know him. But that person does not do what Jesus commands. That person is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them, okay? Let's consider this, okay? So he starts in verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. So he links together these true two, two truths, that if we know him, then we will keep his commands, So we have to talk about and define for just a bit what does knowing him actually mean, okay? And I couldn't help but think that there is a person who, quote-unquote, knew Jesus, who hung around him for three years. His name was Judas. Thank you very much. No surprise, right? It's right in your notes. Judas, right? Now, in one degree... Judas knew Jesus. But this knowledge 
didn't follow with obedience or allegiance. He knew Jesus as the healer. He knew Jesus as the proclaimer of truth. But he saw Jesus as a way to get what he wanted, right? He wanted God to come in his glory to to destroy the bondage of the Romans and to personal gain. He saw Jesus as a means to an end, not an end to himself. So he was looking in his relationship with Jesus to get what he ultimately wanted, not to praise him and worship him and know him and obey him as the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? He put himself over and above Jesus. That, my friends, still continues to happen even to this day where people then start to know things about Jesus. But instead of recognizing his sovereignty and his perfection and that he is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and we have opportunity to get forgiveness of sins and to commit our lives to follow him regardless of where he is going because we trust his heart, because we know he loves us. We see him as a way to get what we ultimately want, right? Bless me, help me, do what I want you to do, Jesus. Jesus is the king So Judas had a knowledge of him, but he didn't know his heart. He didn't acknowledge it. There's also lots of scholars, I'm going to say biblical scholars, that teach at leading Ivy League universities and departments all over the place. And they're pastors with great knowledge of Jesus, but they don't believe in Jesus. So this knowledge that we're talking about is a relational, experiential recognition of who Jesus is. Once you know Jesus for who he is, acknowledge who, um, who, is, who God, no, excuse me, acknowledge the truth of God in him and who he is, that he is God's son, and understand that there's life in him and understand that he's for us and not against us and understand that he is the king and we are not. We come to him in humility. We come to him in gratefulness. We come to him because he loves us and we love him because he first loved us and we gladly surrender our life to him and follow him. This is the knowledge that John is talking about. Knowing him that is intricately connected to keeping his commands. Because if you know him, you want to keep his commands because it is the best thing for us and it honors him the most. This is true about those who have eternal life. We strive to keep his commands. So if you say, well, well, I I know him, right? But you don't keep his commands, and we'll talk about his commands, right? You say, well, I know him. I know Jesus. Yeah, I got I got Jesus, right? If we say that and then don't do, right? Don't do his commands. We're a liar. Right? And the truth is not in us. Right? The truth. By the way, Jesus says that he is the way and he says he is the truth. And he is the light. And we'll talk about it in just a second where Jesus talked about this relationship of the vine and the branches and them being connected, that we are in him and he is in us. And his life flows in us and then he flows from us. If we're connected to him, we will 
gladly look to follow his commands, and he helps us to do it because you cannot follow Jesus in your flesh, right? <laughs> Not going to happen. You can't change your own heart. You can try as you want to change your behavior, but your flesh is strong. Paul the Apostle said this even about himself. I keep doing what I don't want to do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. Right? This is Romans 7. Right? But thanks be to God who helps us. And so we confess our sins. We ask for his power. We rely on his strength because he loves us and we love him and we want to please him. These are people who know Jesus, love Jesus, and will gladly follow Jesus. This is what John is talking about here, that the truth would be in us. If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. God so loved the world, we know that. He loves us, right? And love, in order to be complete, the circle must be closed, right? God loves us, and then it's completed when we return and love God. Therefore, we then are connected. We love God because He first loved us, Jesus loved his Father and responded in obedience to him. We love Jesus and respond in obedience to him. Love being made complete. Belief evidenced by action. Doing the truth so that love for God, the love of God, the love in God, God is truly made complete in us. These are what John is putting forward. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what command is he talking about, right? So he says, mm, keeps his command. So it's important for us to understand what is this command. The good news is we can know, and this is how we know from the words of Jesus himself, and John echoes them in this letter. Now, when Jesus is preaching and teaching, the scribes and the Pharisees, these were the religious um, leaders, these are the ones who studied the, this is the Old Testament law, and they brought it forward. They were like the experts, the professors, the priests, the pastors, right? And one of them came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what's the most important commandment. And Jesus responded by saying, this is in Matthew chapter 22, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love God with all that you have. By the way, this is the fourth, excuse me, the first four commandments. Focus on this. And then he said, this is the first and greatest commandment. That's the Ten Commandments, by the way. This is the first and greatest commandment, verse 39. And the second is like it, Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, all the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. Jesus summed up the Old Testament law. He said, know what this is all about? It's not about rules and regulations. It's an expression of love to God because God loves us, so therefore we honor him. And his is the first name, his is the highest name, and we have no other gods before his name. Loving the Lord our God, not just following it because we have to. Right now I suppose I have to, right, because I'm a Christian, right? It's following him because you get to. You acknowledge his worth and his glory and his majesty because you've seen him. And you're like, I want you. I must follow him. And so we love him with our hearts. We love him with our way we think and our strength 
thank you, sums up our love for God. And the second command is like it, love our neighbor as ourself, right? And there's questions about who is your neighbor. <laughs> Jesus answered that as well because we're always looking for loopholes. You mean that neighbor? Yes, that neighbor. <laughs> if we do that, we fulfill the command of God because love does not harm, right? And God, by the way, is the one that gets to define what love is. You hear me right there? He defines it. My wife says, come on now. <laughs> he defines it. We can twist that as well, right? This is what Jesus commands. All the law and all the prophets are under these two things. Hang on these two things or in these two categories. Now, I'm going to give you a couple other scriptures that you know that I'm telling you the truth here. Jesus said in John 14, 15, so John the Apostle wrote this. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John later in the letter says, okay, and this is his commandment. It tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, and this is his commandment. Okay, making it clear that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. That's loving God, knowing him, honoring him, and Love one another just as he has commanded us. If you truly know Jesus, you will keep his commandments by loving God and loving your neighbor. And keeping his commandment confirms that you have eternal life. Okay. Now, do any of us do this perfectly? I'm so glad you're telling the truth today, right? But that's our desire. It's our direction towards perfection. How about that, right? This is the way that we're moving. And we know that if we get off track, here's the good news. The Holy Spirit's conviction is good news. Like I talked about last week, it's like the rumble strips on the highway of our life, right? When you're falling asleep at the wheel, or you're distracted, or you're leaning to get off the path of life, the Holy Spirit, wake up, right? And hopefully you get back on the path, but if you just ignore that, right, this conviction that keeps us, here's the word, safe whole from wrecking ourselves, hurting those we love, damaging other people. If we keep going in those directions, God in His goodness helps us by His Spirit. That's why we confess, because it helps us, as John points out from the passage right above this one. But he says, hey, if you keep his commandments, moving to love God and neighbor, then the truth is in you. So, are you, how are you doing with this one? <laughs> Where are you at with this one? Right? If you say, that's my heart and that's my direction, be encouraged. That's God's work inside of you. He put that desire in you, by the way. You didn't originate it in yourself. He drew, drew you to himself. He put this in you. He will help you to live this way and find joy this way. He said, that's the direction of your heart or my heart. Be encouraged. We must ask ourselves this question. And if you say, mm, not really, <laughs> Well, I have good news for you. If you confess your sins and come to Christ, right? Ask Him to show Himself to you. You could be made new as you entrust yourself to the goodness and the love and the grace and the mercy and the righteousness and the strength of Christ. Today may be the day of salvation for you, even if you have attended church most of your life. That's what I hope for you. That's what I hope.
for us. So that's the first question. Do I keep His commands? Now, Pastor John, Apostle John, then asks us now the next question. Do I live as Jesus did? This is the next question we are to consider. This is the second part of um, verse 5 of 1 John chapter 2. He goes on and says, now, again, here it is. This is how we know. Okay, there it is. This is how we know. We can know that we have assurance of salvation. This is how we know we are in Him. Now, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, okay? Now, I'm not talking about walking around in sandals and a robe and growing your hair out. I'm not saying that, right? right? I'm not saying that you need to be homeless. I'm not, I'm not saying that. What is being said here is that number one, if we know him, then we keep his commands. And then if we say that we, we claim to live in him, hey, if you are living in Jesus and Jesus is living in you, then we will look to please our Father. We will live to fulfill God's mission. We recognize that our life is not our own. We are bought with a price, right? This is the teaching of John chapter 15, the teaching of Jesus, which I've already referenced being in him. This is the same exact great Greek word which the New Testament was written in. Same word as in the vine and the branches, being in him. So Jesus said that if you abide or remain in me and I am in you, then you will bear much fruit. Now the bad news is if anyone does not abide in him, if anyone does not abide, be connected to him, that person is thrown away like a branch and withers and their branches then are gathered, thrown into a fire and burned. This is John chapter 15. Please go ahead. You can read this Probably at another time, but just read it now if you want to read it. I'm I'm cool with that, right? This is glorious stuff. And this is scary. It's serious stuff. Living like Jesus is not optional for someone who claims to be a Christian. I remember a conversation I had in a different town up in northern Minnesota with a fellow pastor. And he told me, I was sitting in his office in this big, beautiful church. He says, well, discipleship is optional for Christians. It's for those who are going into full-time ministry. I about jumped out of my skin. That was a much longer conversation which I brought many scriptures to him, like this one. Right? Hey, have, have you read John chapter 15? <laughs> have you read that? Let's read that. This is not optional. And unfortunately, unfortunately, no, that's not even a strong enough word, tragically, perhaps even demonically. We have people that believe the gospel as a way to get rich versus a way to glorify God and become like Him. People believe, again, that, well, you know, Jesus is cool. He's the Son of God, but I got my own thing going. If you are captured by Christ, you can do no other than be with Him and follow Him And live like him because he is life and has the words of life. And there's no one like him. There's no life outside of him. There's no eternal life but in him. This is being a Christian. This is abiding. And it talks about bearing fruit. And there's a character of bearing fruit, and there's conduct in bearing fruit, right? Character, the fruit of the Spirit. Hopefully you know this, which is what? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. 
God works that in us so that we are becoming more like Christ in our character. Granted, we are cracked pots, right? We leak, right? And we have issues and we need the Holy Spirit to fill us again, right? The, whole, the scripture talks about being filled and being refilled by the Spirit, being connected and continue to be connected to the vine. So he works that in us. So these things are growing in our character, but also there's conduct, and they're growing in our character, and they're showing in our conduct, right? This is the loving the neighbor as yourself. It is expressing these things in your relationship with your spouse, or with your kids, or with your grandparents, or with your co-workers, or with your schoolmates, or the people that you don't like, right? It's doing good because you overcome evil with good, what Jesus did. It all stems from him, right? We become more like him because we are in him and he is in us and we can't help it because we are connected and this is what John points to us. Do you, do I live this way? We see this all over the scripture. Here's another one, Colossians chapter 1. This is the apostle um, Paul saying, hey, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Here it is, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is because you love him, you get to do stuff that he's doing, right? Versus I have to do stuff, right? And sometimes... The Holy Spirit drags you unwilling, right? But then you go and say, this is right and good. I'm so glad I did this. Bearing fruit in every good work like that. And as we do, we're increasing in the knowledge of God. I hope that you, more, you know more about God today than you did last year at this time. Right? Have you been growing in this way? Are you experiencing more of his presence in your life? Right? Are you coming to the word of life, the Bible, and reading and growing in your knowledge? This is how you're going to grow. Well, Dave, I come to church. So glad you're here. Right? It's right for us to love one another. It's right for us to be connected in community. This is actually a command of Christ to come together. But you also need to connect with him from his word on your own. Okay, Read it, and more importantly, let it read you looking into the mirror of the word and say, God, thank you that I'm beholding you. I have never seen a person walk away from Christ who is daily reading Christ's word. Never. It's a drift away. We take a small step, we take a small step, we take a small step by degrees, and then and over time, the one degree angle, the two degree angle, the ten degree angle, we go into very different places. Right? Growing in the knowledge of God. This is the prayer God will answer every single time because it's His will. God, help me to grow in my knowledge of You. He will help you. God, help me to bear fruit. He will help you. So living as Jesus means, doing the good works, following him that God has created and designed and prepared for you to do. Ephesians 2, verse 10. He will help you do this. From loving your neighbors, putting in fence posts, mowing their lawn, Feeding all of their lovely pets. I'm getting better. I'm recovering. Feeding all of them because they're God's creatures. But whatever you need to do, right? Now, he takes it now to a step further. And we're going to look at the third point here. First, either tests. Do I keep his commands? Yes, no. If yes, then yes, you have eternal life. If no, then you don't. Second, do I live as Jesus? If you say yes, granted, he's working in us, he's helping us, right? This isn't a self-righteous thing, right? This is humility, acknowledging God's work in you. Do I live as Jesus did? If yes, 
great. Do not, don't deceive yourself. And this is the third one. Do I love my brother and sister? So now John, again, is getting more and more specific to us. This is 1 John chapter 2, then continuing in verse 7. Now he says, dear friends, my dear friends. Now, I'm not writing you a, a new command. This shouldn't be new to you all, but I'm writing you an old one, which you have heard since the beginning. Okay? Scholars say, take this since the beginning of them knowing the gospel. Right? This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It's truth is seen in him, which is Christ, and also seen in you. Why? Because the darkness is passing, and the true light, right? And he talked about light, is already shining. This is an ongoing work. So Pastor John loves these people, and the church, he loves this church, and he loves, I believe, you and I as well, dearly. So what he wrote for us was an old command made new in Christ. And they had heard this command from the beginning when they first heard the gospel, so again, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the old command named, made new? Now, the fact that John begins to talk about love and hate in the next verses, we're going to see them in just a second, 9 and 11, suggests that the commandment John has in mind in verse 7 and 8 is the love commandment. And we talked about this from John 13, 34, where Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I had loved you you, that you also love one another. So the old commandment is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But it was seen new in Christ to say, hey, love each other as I have loved you, as I have shown you, right? This is a new fulfillment of an old command that you also love one another. Also in 2 John 5, he quotes the new commandment and says, it's not new, right? And now I beg you, lady, this is the next letter we're going to look at, the lady that the letter was written to, 2 John not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the old one we have had from the beginning, that we would love one another. So we know that the commandment of 1 John 2, which is some sense, both it's new and it's old, is the commandment of love that Jesus gave his disciples. Right from the passage of the vine and the branches, again, he's teaching this or expounding this, that we are to love one another as I have loved you you. This was a command that was given from and originated in Christ. Okay? It's coming to Jesus and having Jesus work through us. Evidence that we are connected to him. Now, he provided this example with his life, right? He said again in the vine and the, pa- uh, vine and the branches passage, for, uh, John chapter 15, greater love has no one than this that someone laid down his life for his friends. Do you catch this? Right? This is the love that is self-sacrificing. This is the love that gladly lays down, or in obedience, lays down your life for your friends. Right? Well, you say, well, I'll do that. Well, do you do that? Right? How about lays down his life for his spouse? How are you doing there, Jack? Right? Well, you don't know who I'm married to. Hmm, Jesus does. Jesus does. He didn't say, yeah, all you people who were married to a cranky person. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let them go. Right? No, he didn't say that. <laughs> Lays down his life for his friends. Who's the number one person that's done this? Thank you. It's Jesus absolutely did that. No. Am I saying that you should go get crucified? No, right? In the sense of you're not being, you're not the savior of the world, okay? Jesus was. But this is giving your life for the benefit of others, right? This is hard to do, by the way. Maybe it's easy for you. It's hard for me to do sometimes because I'm selfish. I'm impatient. I can be rude, right? I can be self-serving, proud. My wife's like, keep preaching, brother, right? <laughs> she, she's, not, she's not saying that. She's not saying that. But I can. I acknowledge it. I don't like it. I hate it about myself, to be real frankly honest. Hate it. 
can't wait to be done with the struggle of sin. I have it. You have it. Right? So God, help us to lay down our lives. And as you do, and we do, and we do, this is beautiful because we are loving other people. And this light we have seen in Him, this is what John's talking about. The truth is seen in Him and in you. That's amazing. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Jesus' light is shining in His life. And now... His light is shining within us because He is the light, but we're also the light of the world. Do you understand that Jesus said this? He's the light that shines through us. We don't originate it, we carry it. And God's Christ's love for the world can shine brightly in you, right? That's amazing. It's already shining. So shine, right? Shine to bring glory to God. Do the good works to honor God, but also so that people would understand why you do what you do. Well, they're just a nice person. You're not in your heart a nice person. You're self-centered, but in Christ you are a loving person. You guys understand this? Do this. It's important. It makes a difference in the world, and it also confirms in us that God is working until we see the light in its fullness. John continues, right? He gets very practical. Verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light, right? Be in the light as he is in the light. We talked about it. Anyone who claims I'm in the light, right? But that person hates a brother or sister, and I'm not talking your physical brothers and sisters, but they may be in that category as believers. If anyone's, these are brothers and sisters in the faith. So you claim to be in the light, but you hate your brother and sister, you're still in darkness. <laughs> what? Anyone who loves your brothers and sister lives in light. And there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Okay, This is where we're stopping. My guess is that your deepest wounds are from other Christians. I'm just telling you that. Why, why would you say that? Because my deepest wounds, wounds are from other Christians. <laughs> If you're a human, you've been hurt. Why? Because we're in a fallen world. We have a sinful nature. It was not how God originally designed it because of our rebellion. We got the fruit of our rebellion. The wages of sin is death. Jesus came to reverse the curse because this world, we are in darkness, but he's the light and so at times we hurt each other. If you've been deeply wounded by a fellow Christian, you have no right to hate them. But you don't know what they did to you. I, I probably do. Was it evil? Absolutely. Was it unright? Yeah. Was it unloving? Absolutely. But if you hold on to hate, it's like you're swallowing poison hoping that they die, right? It destroys you. Are you and have you been wounded? Yes. Have I? Absolutely to the core. Right? I'm not saying that things don't hurt. They hurt and not telling you, well, you know, it's okay. It's not okay. But we have a responsibility in Christ right? to not hate them. Now, can you do it instantaneously? Probably not. Right? It took me a couple years to work through some heart hurts of mine. A couple years. I chewed on it for a long time. 
And just like a wound that you get cut deep, if you get cut deep in the arm, wherever, you know, how deeper it is, the longer it takes to hurt, to, to heal. But it heals over time. The best way that I've found to heal and how you know that you're actually healed from a wound of a brother and sister, when you can genuinely pray that God would bless them, then you're healed. And if you can't, you're still wounded there. Not that you hate them and they're a fallen child of God just like you are and me. But when you hear their name and you don't recoil and want to fight back, you're in a good place. This happens. Remember having uh, lunch with a guy who was sitting there at Applebee's as many years ago and this person came in we're sitting there and we're trying to talk. He's like, oh, I hate that person. He literally told me this. I was like, what? And he starts, yeah, this is no joke. And he started ragging on the person. And then someone in goes, oh, I hate that person. Blah, 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 blah. I was burning up inside because this was someone who was connected to the church I was pastoring. <laughs> and I said, hey, hey, you know, we don't have a right to hate anyone, especially our fellow brothers and sisters. Now this person literally hates me. I'm not kidding. He's talked about me. People come and say, you know what that guy said to me? He says he, like, he, says he hates you. And you know what I could honestly say? Well, I don't hate him. Right? And I pray for him. Because right? he's been blinded. Right? I pray for his actual salvation. Even though he claims he's a Christian. Dave, what, are you praying rightly? I'm praying this passage. Anyone hates their brother and sister, then the light is not in them. Walking around in darkness, right? If you hate them, you stumble around because your orientation towards the person is you want them destroyed, you want them to pay, you want to be vindicated, you want them eradicated, right? It's not God's life, and you're stumbling around hurting yourself, and you are probably hurting them. Now, I'm not saying you have to be best friends with the person, but you and I are to, oh, it's a command. <laughs> Love your enemies. And what goes with that? You've read it. Pray for those who persecute you. And that's God's work in your heart, so you can genuinely desire the best for them and the God's best for you. This is the best and the truest and the freest way to live. And you can say amen to that. It's the best way. And so I'm asking all of us to examine ourselves in this. And I don't know all the stuff that's happened to you, but I do know stuff has happened to you. Who comes to mind in this? Have you been healed? Do you you see God's work in your heart towards this person. Can you pray for them? You want God's best for them. You may have work to do here, or you say, I'm trying, or you say, you know what? No, I'm holding on to my hate until I die. Don't be that person. It's going to kill you, and it's not going to help. Ask Christ for his help and he will help you. Okay. So we're concluding and we're going to sing a, a, a song and then we're going to be dismissed. So John, right? And this is the conclusion. Our beloved apostle. And this portion that we looked at today, connect it to the portion before it. Okay. <laughs> connect it to what we're going to look at in the weeks to come. He's given us three more tests to give us assurance that we have eternal life. I hope you feel this stuff today. But these we are to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13. Here they are. Anyone who says, I know him, must be obedient to keep his commands. Anyone cl cl who claims to abide in him 
must live as Jesus lived. Anyone who claims to be in the light must love his brother and sister. Again, don't freak out. Oh, my word, I have failed. I have failed too, and I'll probably fail tomorrow. Right? But I run back to the light, not away from it. Right? <laughs> Tell the truth, right? Confess my sin, God help me, and he will help you. Right? Right? This is what I want for us. This is what I want for you. This is what the world needs. This is what God wants for you. Be assured or be convicted and come towards the one who loves you most and lays down his life for you. As we together look to walk in the light, to shine God's truth, become more and more like Jesus following in his footsteps and walking in the light. Father, I'm so grateful uh, that you've shown the gospel of grace to our hearts. You've called us to be with you and to be like you. God. You've given us purpose and you've given us a plan and you've given us a spirit to help us, God, to empower us, to teach us, to convict us, to comfort us. God, I thank you for my friends, my brothers and sisters in this place this morning. God, I see you working here. God, we're humbled and grateful. God, I ask if anything uh, made it confusing for people, God, that you would help them. And I pray what is clear to us, Lord, we'll look at it truthfully. God, I'm grateful that you are working in our hearts and you are helping us to become like Jesus. And we say, help us more but see more of your glory and your goodness. God, we pray for those who we love, who claim to <laughs> be Christians. But these tests, they would probably flunk. God, we ask that they and we would come to you in spirit and in truth. God, we ask that the light of Christ will see your glory and come to you. And... Or here that says, mm, Pastor, man, I need to do some work in my soul. God, I ask, Lord, that there would be a yes to you. I think following you in a humility to say, I can't do this. You have to do it in me. That we would treasure you more than anyone and anything. You'd be our greatest treasure. So work in us, we ask. Thank you for your goodness to us and your help and your strength and the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.